welcome to you. And I want to introduce you to these wonderful, wonderful, fabulous students. This is the University of California, Berkeley. These are the best students ever, all right? Okay. Uh, and, and, not incidentally, this is the best university ever. Best, best. It is, it's true. No, I'm, no, wait, I don't. No, this is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fooling around. We, we, later on in the term, we're actually going to be looking at public universities, and the University of California, Berkeley, is the best public university, I would say, some data show in the world, right? So you are in the best public university, and public universities, for reasons that I will get into later on, with you, and also with you, are, <laughs> are really extraordinarily important in terms of upward mobility in terms of many of the values that we're talking about in this class. So, in any event, I want to introduce you to them, and then you all, I want to introduce you to people who are going to be viewing this. So, you know, you can wave or not, or... <laughs> all right, so here's what we're going to do. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, people's values with regard to the distribution of wealth. And what I'd like to do, and I'm going to do it in a moment here, is to show you uh, a chart and actually have you vote, have you vote, and you, you who are watching, you can vote too. Uh, on, uh, now, this, which of these distributions of wealth would you prefer? I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna show here two distributions of wealth. They're gonna be in a bar graph. Uh, and you can, you, you, I wanna, I, we'll figure out some way of getting you to see this bar graph, all right? Uh, this, these bar graphs uh, came from uh, a, uh, 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 some professors who uh, did some survey work uh, a few years ago. If I've got the name right, I think it's Bill Norton, Michael Norton, uh, at Harvard Business School and his associates. Uh, they did extensive surveys, and they looked at, for example, I'm going to show you up here. This is one possible distribution. This is, let's call this distribution A of wealth. And what I want you who are watching this, and all of you who are watching this, to look at is that this is the, the blue represents the top 20% of people. That is the richest 20% of people. And under this distribution, the richest 20% of people get 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, more than half of all the wealth. And they, uh, the, the next 20% get about 20% of all of the wealth, and the next middle 20% of people get about 10% of all the wealth, and the next 20% of people get this percentage of the wealth. So this, this bar, in terms of this particular choice, represents total wealth in the United States, and this is how it's divided up according to this chart. All right? Now, I'm going to give you, and all of you who are watching this, uh, another option. And this is, let's call this number B, B, the B option. And this is how we're going to divide up. This is the top 20%, takes a smaller percentage, and the middle, and the second 20%, and so on. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to tell me, and tell each other, and tell all of you, and you can do this too. You can do this too. Uh, what you choose with regard to A or B in terms of the ideal distribution. Not what the distribution is, but what you think the ideal distribution should be. Or, are you ready? Okay. Uh, so, on your clickers. Oh, I, wait a minute. Before, I should explain to you. Uh, they all have these little clickers. <laughs> do you, you want to hold up your clickers? Just hold up. Okay. See, do you see the clickers? All right. These clickers, these clickers allow, this is, uh, they allow people to describe exactly what their choices are anonymously, okay? So it's a pretty good indicator of at least what a group, and this is a fairly large group. Th by the way, I should say, this is not the typical size of a Berkeley class. <laughs> uh, for any of you who ha are thinking about coming to Berkeley, any of you who have kids or grandkids coming to Berkeley, this, this is large, this is large. But we divide up into sections, and we have a great time all right? Okay. So, uh, on the count of three, why don't you choose which of these you prefer? One, two, three, choose. Uh, okay. And uh, 
Oh, you've already chosen. <laughs> OK, let's stop the choosing. Uh, and let's actually see how many of you prefer, or what percentage of you prefer A, and what percentage of you prefer B. Uh, well, 86% of you prefer B, and 13% of you prefer A. Well, this is Berkeley, right? <laughs> now, you, you can do the same thing. And what we're going to be interested in is how you choose as well. Now, you and everybody like you, you are not completely random. I mean, you have decided to join us. So there's some self-selection bias there. Uh, but it's interesting. You'll be able to compare yourself to Berkeley. By the way, just to do a slightly different variation on this, uh, I'd like you now taking the same, let's, let's get rid of this particular, yeah, taking the same two possibilities, the same two graphs. Tell me what you think most Americans choose in terms of A or B on the ideal distribution of wealth. What do you think most Americans choose? And let's, let's go. We'll start right now. A one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We'll go about 10. You can choose. You, you get involved in the same thing. All right? Do the same thing. OK, let's end the bidding right here. And let's see what you think. So more of you think that uh, people will choose A, but a substantial member, number of you think that most Americans, most Americans would choose B. Well, we'll find out a little bit from this experiment, uh, because you'll decide, right? Let's see. Uh, I will show you now in the next graph what most Americans actually choose. You are absolutely right. Most Americans choose exactly like what you choose. Now, again, there were a lot of you who thought that America, a lot of most Americans would choose A, but actually they chose B. And you keep that in mind as well. So this is the ideal for most Americans. And this is a wide survey. Uh, Michael. Norton and his associates did this survey. I think it was a number of, this was about uh, 2011. Uh, so uh, this is, it's just sort of interesting. Uh, now, what we're going to do now, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you what the actual distribution of wealth is. Uh, people think the actual distribution is A. Uh, but no, I'm going to show you what the actual distribution of wealth is, the real distribution. Uh, now, for those of you, uh, those, those of you who, are, who are watching this and following along, uh, the, the actual distribution, the real distribution, is very far removed from either what people might assume other people assume the distribution is or what their own ideals are. Uh, in other words, this is way off. This is way skewed. The top 20% has a huge percentage of total wealth. And, you know, uh, that doesn't, you know, the bottom, the bottom 20% and even the fourth, uh, fourth quintile uh, almost doesn't show up at all on here. Uh, now, why do I, why did I do this experiment with you and with you? Because there is, in terms of this gap between the ideal and the reality, a huge, huge cognitive dissonance. Uh, when I say cognitive dis dissonance, what I'm talking about is when you find out that this is the real distribution, and you've just gone through an exercise when you are actually talking about what your ideal distribution is, uh, you, and you see the gap between the ideal and the real, uh, there is something in your brain that went, whoa, I heard it. I heard you all say, woo. So that must have meant something, right? What is woo? What is it? What is woo? What did you, what did, just, I'm just interested, any of you. Sorry? See, it's surprise. Is it, it was it just surprise? Or was there something else? Sorry? Anger, surprise, anything else? Outrage? 
disappointment. Uh, so in other words, the, cog the cognitive dissonance between the ideal and the reality uh, kind of sets up something going on in, in you, and particularly when you understand that most other people in this country share your ideal, and how can it be that the reality is that far removed from the ideal that most of us share? And even our assumption about what other people share if they don't share that ideal. Now that cognitive dissonance, that ooh, is really important. It's important in terms of social change. And one thing we're going to be discussing in this class, and one thing we might be discussing, we, you know, we could go on discussing this too, uh, is public policy. Public policy without the ooh factor. I'm calling it the ooh factor, because the ooh factor is you know, disappointment and surprise and, and anger and everything else. Without the ooh factor, public policy might as well be on the moon. It doesn't have any capacity to actually be implemented. But when you add the emotional, outrage, sadness, anger, everything else, then you get the possibility for social change. Do you follow me? When there is a wide gap between the reality and the ideal, wide enough that people actually feel some dissonance in their heads, you get social change. There are three elements of social change, three fundamental elements. And you go back in time in American history, you can see this in other countries as well, uh, there are three big elements. One is a widening gap between the ideal and the reality, the ooh factor we just talked about. There is a second, and that is broad public knowledge of the gap. Now this is where you come in, and you all indirectly come in, because most people don't know that the gap is this big. If there was broad public knowledge of the gap between an ideal and reality, whatever the ideal is, and whatever the reality is, when there is broad public knowledge, then there is the possibility for social change, but if people don't know, you don't get an ooh factor at all. But there is also a third very important aspect of social change. And never forget the third, third factor here, or third element. And that is widespread sense of efficacy. That is the ability to close the gap. Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you follow what I'm saying? Do you follow what I'm saying? That is, even if you find that there's a huge gap, and even if that gap is widely understood, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. I, we're talking about ideal and reality. Even if it's widely understood, if people don't think there's anything that can be done, if they think that they are ineffective, that there's no possibility for change, then you still don't get social change. You have to have all three. And this is not a comment about liberal versus conservative or progressive versus something else. This is about social change in any direction. There are ideals, there are realities, there is widespread public understanding, and there is efficacy, a sense that something can be done. When you get the three together, you get social change. If you don't have the three, then you get essentially stagnation, or you get the status quo. Now, the reason I bring this up, and the reason I bring it up in our first class together, is because we're going to be spending the next six weeks looking at a system. And if you want to join us, well, we were filled up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but we might get back to you with some focuses, maybe at the end of the class. But if you, what we're going to do is, we're, over the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at the system, a political, economic, social system. When I say system, I mean that you can't separate politics, economics, and sociology. They're all part of the same system. And it is a human-made system. The rules are made by us. They are made in society. 
And the next half of the course, we're going to be looking at what can be done. But if we don't have in our heads a background theory of social change, then it just becomes airy, fairy, academic, interesting, but not particularly pertinent. Which is why I said at the start of class, I had two goals for you. I'm not going to tell you what the second goal is until the end of our last class. But, but, it has a lot to do with you, and it has a lot to do with you. See you next week.